Welcome everyone to Ask the Sage Live. My name is Brandy Camel, your community lead for Dungeons and Dragons. And I am joined today by the illustrious Jeremy Crawford, our fantastic lead rules designer. How are you doing this fine Sunday? I'm doing great. And I'm excited that we get to spend part of our Sunday together talking about Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, I've been I have been awaiting this panel all weekend long, and I'm sure many others have as well. Uh, I know that you're accustomed to doing these Ask the Sage Live uh, sessions at conventions and events. Um, and I think this is one of the few times you've done one online. So let's walk through what that means. Um, over the past few weeks, or actually really over the past week in particular, we've been gathering the most pressing questions from our fans across a variety of social media, pla media platforms like uh, Reddit or Discord or Twitter uh, and so much more on Dungeons & Dragons. We mostly looked at questions on rules clarifications or tips on playing the game, whether you're a player or a DM. So we've got a selection of the most frequently asked, interesting, or fun questions that we could find. And we've only got a little under an hour, so we're going to try to get through as many of them as we can. <laughs> Does that sound right? That, that sounds perfect. And I will do my best to not give an entire lecture on each question. <laughs> I'll, try, I'll try to be fast. I'm sure that's why people have tuned in, though, because they love to hear your insights on Dungeons & Dragons. So let's jump right into it, because I know we want to get through as many as possible. Uh, our first one comes from our Discord server. Uh, Bazim Gorag, the Firebringer, asks, uh, if someone is flying in a reverse gravity area, and then I cast Earthbind, which direction do they go? That is... Wow, what a great question to start with. So... <laughs> The reverse gravity spell, and here I'm opening up my player's handbook. Uh, anytime I do uh, these Ask the Sage lives, whether in person or now online, I always have my books because what I always like to really show, not just talk about, people have heard me talk about this, is look things up uh, because D&D is not a memorization challenge. Uh, no one should ever feel like they've got to have this rich, expansive game entirely in their head. It's why we have D&D Beyond. It's why we have our physical books. We can look things up. I always share, too, one reason why I look things up is I've worked on multiple versions of all of these <laughs> things. So there's always the risk. If I just go by mem my memory, I'm actually going to be referring to two editions ago, mm -hmm. a playtest version that's not actually in the book. <laughs> so that's, that's why... Less of a problem I have and probably more of a problem for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it is a frequent, frequent problem. <laughs> All right. So here we have reverse gravity. And so what reverse gravity does uh, is it makes it so that everyone in the region of this spell, where you've decided to just make everything topsy-turvy, uh, it makes it so that they fall upward. Now, the Earthbind spell says that you descend toward the ground, meaning the Earthbind spell counteracts reverse gravity. And because I know some people are wondering, does reverse gravity then cause Earthbind to call, cause you to fall toward the sky. But in D&D, which is an exceptions-based game, meaning the specific exception that one rule makes makes an exception to other rules, whether those are general rules or other specific rules, essentially specificity wins in D&D. And so... Each of these creates this situation where reverse gravity is creating this exception where suddenly falling is upward, uh, but Earthbind has a different specificity, which it very explicitly says you descend toward the ground. And here's the thing. If reverse gravity was going to change how Earthbind functions, reverse gravity would also have to redefine what ground is, but it doesn't. Uh, in reverse gravity, the ground is still the ground. Uh, all reverse gravity does is change how falling works. But Earthbind, again, very specifically says the flyer descends toward the ground. Meaning, Earthbind is a great way to save a friend who might be 
uh, in jeopardy of falling up <laughs> into, <laughs> far up into the sky, you can try to earthbind them uh, down uh, with that spell. Fantastic. And I love that question in particular because it gives you more of the broader philosophy of, you know, this is this is how we look at rules, the the specific versus general and and how that kind of hashes out. Um, and, and and that that distinction, if anyone's ever wondering why that, like why do we design rules like that? We do that actually as a mercy to to all of us who play D and D and DM the game, because what that means is the words on the page or on your screen, if you're using an online tool, you can rely on them. We write them to be your buddy, to help you out when you're when you're playing or DMing, and we do our best to make it so that the rules aren't tricking you. Uh, and that you don't you don't actually have to come to a person like me. That's our ideal uh, to figure out what the heck is going on in this game. We want the words to matter, and so that's why for us specificity matters. Uh, that the the words we choose we choose very carefully, so that if we're doing our jobs right, and sometimes we we miss the mark and things aren't as clear as we would want them to be, but it, our goal is a clarity that will make play as smooth as possible. Awesome. Well, let's move on to our next question. Uh, this one also came from Discord. Basic Braining asks, if a fae paladin, for example, a fairy, uses channel divinity that turns a fae, such as in, uh, with Ancients and Watchers, what happens to them? Do they have to make the save? What happens if they fail? Do they run from themselves? <laughs> I, love, I love this notion of... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> having a big oops <laughs> as you as you turn yourself and make yourself run away from yourself. <laughs> All right, so let, let's take a look. I'm, I opened up to Oath of the Ancients, and I'm looking at Turn the Faithless, uh, where you present your holy your holy symbol, and each fay or fiend within thirty feet of you that can hear you must make a Wisdom saving throw. Now, that's a great question because you could interpret this as, well, I'm within 30 feet of myself <laughs> and I can hear myself. So first I'll tell you intent. Our intent is that no, you are not turning yourself. Uh, and here we are relying on sort of English idiom which is uh, one of the examples I often like to say is if if I walked up to you and I said, Brandy, here is a box of 12 delicious donuts. Please hand them out to people within 60 feet of you you can see. In regular English usage, you would understand me to mean you are giving them to other people. Uh, and... And that is sort of what we rely on here. Now, that serves us well most of the time in the rules, sort of relying on idiomatic English, which is just a fancy way of saying sort of the English we use every day. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes there can be some vagueness. And so that's where, again, in a forum like this, I can provide at least some insight into design intent. Our intent is not that you're turning yourself. And and really, any any place in the rules where you encounter a situation like this of it says, do X to people within Y feet of you, we unless it's a beneficial thing, we mm. almost never mean you. Uh, and it, whereas we view it differently when we're talking about uh, just sort of areas of effect, like you cause a big explosion over there. Uh, well, if you happen to include yourself in the explosion, okay. And But with that explosion, you're not actually choosing the people you're targeting, you're choosing a place, and then people within that, they are then targeted by that effect that blooms out. Uh, and so if you happen to be in that area of effect, well, I, I don't know why you decided to uh, <laughs> drop the fireball on yourself, but uh, you, that, that was your choice. 
I mean, I've I've definitely been in situations where it's been warranted. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, true. Sometimes the best way to get as many of those monsters in the explosion as possible is to just drop it on yourself. Yeah. All right. Our next question comes from Reddit. Uh, we we took some questions from the D&D Next Reddit, and this comes from Bob Splosion. If you cast Aid, which increases your maximum health, then suffer an effect that decreases your maximum health, does Aid eat that health reduction and you get away unscathed, or does it bypass it? So those two effects, are, it's basically as long as their durations overlap each other, they both apply. So aid, you know, if aid is, and this isn't the actual number in the spell, but to actually, you know, not take time looking up every single thing, but <laughs> if aid will say add, increases your maximum uh, hit points by five, mm -hmm. and then another effect reduces your maximum hit points uh, by five, they would essentially cancel each other out. Uh, if aid does five and the other one reduces by three, well, then your uh, maximum hit points are increased only by two. Mm -hmm. um, but then this is where it gets interesting. When, let's say, the the maximum lasts longer than the aid spell, the minute the aid spell goes away, then that maximum reduction hits your regular hit points in full. Uh, so basically, aid counteracts however much aid can while the spell's duration is active, but once the spell goes away, uh, then you're faced with the full reduction. What this means, by the way, is that aid is a very effective way to temporarily counteract a a reduction because it can also go in the other order. Mm -hmm. Someone might be subjected to a hit point maximum reduction. And then if the group doesn't have magic that can remove that reduction, you at least, if somebody has the aid spell prepared, you can use that to temporarily counteract some or all of the reduction. I would not be me if I did not say, so it's like a Band-Aid then. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, which aid really is. I mean, aid right. is an amazing Band-Aid uh, because, uh, because it's a hit point maximum increaser. That means you can keep healing back up. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if you lose those extra hit points, well, then you can heal back up. That's why aid as a increaser of your maximum is actually more effective than something that, say, gives you temporary hit points, because temporary hit points can't be restored. Uh, once you lose them, they're gone. But, ooh, aid, you can just keep, if you have healing, you can keep restoring uh, that that extra cushion that that spell gives you. Awesome. Our next one comes from Discord. Uh, I'm totally going to murder this name, so I apologize in advance. I'm used to seeing these in text and not having to say them out loud. So, uh, Ogwen Mock uh, asks, what is the decision-making reason for having errata that's not always being documented in the errata release, also referred to as stealth errata? So uh, it's never our intention to have uh, sort of secret significant changes. Uh, sometimes we've actually made a change and it just, it accidentally was left off the official change list, which is one of the errata docs we publish. And if anyone watching uh, has never seen the list of errata documents, which is, these are public documents that list any substantive change we've made to uh, rules or lore in a book that's already in print, uh, you can find those if you search for our Sage Advice Compendium PDF. In that PDF, we have links to all of the current errata docs. Now, sometimes, again, we'll make a change and we'll accidentally not include it in the, in the document. There are other times where we will make like typo corrections in a reprint of a book, and those don't go into errata docs. Because again, the, those documents are really meant to just collect substantive changes, things that could affect how your character plays at the table, how a monster functions, uh, or a significant piece of lore. So there's a little bit of a gray area. Sometimes in the process of fixing like a typo, we might reword something else in a sentence, really maybe just for like 
the beauty of the wording. You know, we're really just making sort of an editorial call, and we might accidentally make a slight substantive change, and then only later when a fan points it out to us that, hey, this seems like a more significant change that maybe maybe belongs in, errata, in an errata document, we have then actually gone back and added those to the errata documents. Uh, so again, we're never, we're never like sort of, uh, you know, like a rogue doing a stealth check and like, all right, we'll <laughs> see if we can sneak this change in. No, it's just, it's usually through our, either our vetting process it slipped through or uh, it was almost like a, a sideways change that occurred while we were making some other change uh, on the same page in a particular book. Uh, which, by the way, I'll, I'll say one more thing along these lines, because a lot of people sometimes wonder, too, about the timing of errata documents. Uh, uh, some people would love it if we were issuing changes more often. We time the release of those documents to coincide with the release of new printings of the books that actually contain those changes in them. Uh, because we want to make sure that whenever we publish these documents, there are actually books out in the world that reflect that version of the game. We don't want to be in a situation where the only place you can actually find the official wording of the game is in a PDF somewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. For us, it it has to exist, uh, you know, in in one of these <laughs> for for us uh, then to release to the world and say, okay, now this is for real uh, because in fact there are books now out in the world where this new wording exists, gotcha. which means sometimes we sit on changes until those new those new printings are are available for people. Yeah, and those new printings can take a while sometimes, just depending mm -hmm. on, especially in the, the world we live in now with many product delays and shipping delays and things of that nature. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, although as people will discover within the next few months, there's actually been a buildup of these. And so we're suddenly going to release a whole bunch <laughs> yeah, fairly soon. And oh. that's really because of, again, mm -hmm. uh, just the, the process of printing and getting those updated books out into the world. All right. Folks, I'll have to keep an eye out for that coming up. Uh, yeah. Our next question comes from Twitter. Um, I love this user's name uh, because I'm pretty sure it's meant to be Captain Free Time, and I want to be that captain. Um, so sending has become a bit of a meme in my groups due to how vague familiar is as a requirement. Could you clarify the intent of the spell? Is my fifth level dweeb able to prank the uh, prank call the Xanathar because they know of them or have researched them a lot, or do we need to meet? So great question. Here is where our reliance on idiomatic English, which again just means everyday English, can create some unintended uh, rules interpretation challenges. Mm -hmm. So when we say familiar, we mean the usual meaning of the word, which is mean, which means you know them well. Uh, you you are you are accustomed to interacting with them, which is to say, just knowing their name, you're not familiar with them. Uh, you know, I uh, I I know uh, many celebrities' names, but I have never met them. I am not familiar with them. <laughs> Uh, I am I am aware of their existence, which is not the same as being familiar with them. Uh, now, even though uh, I say that and say, you know, that's the intent, that's what we mean when we say familiar, that is a great example of how if we were writing uh, the spell today, we would be even more specific. Because this is a question that has come up. Uh, a number of times since the player's handbook was released in 2014, which is always a sign of, well, we, we could have spilled a little more ink to make this, the intent super duper clear. Uh, but again, intent is, we, we mean that sort of the usual sense of familiar, which is, uh, you know them, uh, like for real, <laughs> and, and, not, and not you just know of them. Probably slightly more than acquaintance, like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, not not just uh, you were once at the same party and you caught a glimpse <laughs> of them across the room. Like, uh, I, I would hope you had at least one meaty conversation with them or were present for someone else having a, an extensive conversation 
and you might have even made eye contact a number of times, uh, that kind of familiarity. Perfect. Uh, let's return to Discord for a moment. Uh, Niv Mixit asks a question on invisibility. Uh, I actually saw this pop up in a few different places, but this was the first one, first version of this question I saw. The invisible condition has the isolated bullet point attack rolls against the creature have disadvantage, and the creature's attack rolls have advantage. This means that C invisibility and other non sight senses don't stop the advantage on attacks from being invisible. Is this intended, assumed to be ignored, or a target for future errata? So uh, I love this question. It really drills into that specificity I was talking about earlier. So before I answer the question, uh, I will also point out there are abilities in the game that explicitly say the, the target of them, uh, like the fairy fire spell does this, gains no advantage from the invisibility condition, meaning the whole thing is shut off for them, uh, which would include the second bullet. Mm -hmm. But if you're in a situation where that bullet is not explicitly shut off and, and the questioner is astute in noticing that bullet does not explicitly rely on others being incapable of seeing the invisible person. Because we know in D&D, this, you know, multiverse of magic, mm -hmm. there, are, there are cases where you might actually be able to discern uh, a, an invisible person through some means. If the means that you're using does not explicitly shut off the advantages of the invisible condition, you can be in the odd situation of you can see them yet that second bullet still applies. If you're wondering how to rationalize that narratively, and by the way, this is intentional. That's why we have things in the game that explicitly shut the whole condition off, but mm -hmm. other places we don't. Imagine an invisible person, say, uh, under the effects of the invisibility spell. Mm -hmm. Even if by some means you can sort of, you can discern them, Imagine that there still is some strange magical shimmer over them that is affecting your ability to target them effectively. If you've ever seen uh, the old Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, Predator, there were, mm. there were portions in that film where people actually caught a glimpse of the Predator, so you could actually see them but the predator still was cloaked and had this odd shimmer. You know, they were sort of uh, semi-transparent. Mm -hmm. Imagine that when you're imagining a situation, the odd situation where I can see the invisible person, but I haven't managed to overcome every aspect of the condition. So you're in this kind of in-between state in terms of your perception of them. Like, okay, I'm seeing their, their outline but they still, some of the magic of their invisibility is, is giving them the benefit of that bullet uh, that gives them advantage on their attack, attack rolls and others having disadvantage on their attack rolls against them. Uh, so yeah, there are, there are some neat nuances <laughs> that come out. Uh, and what I encourage DMs and players when you encounter things like this, and this has always been a factor in Dungeons & Dragons, going all the way back to the 70s, where with all of these different elements in play, they'll suddenly interact and create these fascinating corner cases and whatnot. I, as a DM, taking my game designer hat off and putting my Dungeon Master hat on or my player hat on, I view these circumstances as an opportunity for creative narrative. It's a chance to decide... What is going on in the world that's creating this fascinating interaction or this corner case? And sometimes rationalizing them and coming up with a narrative reason for them can come up with some of the most wonderfully odd moments in the game. And, and the thing I want to share with everyone watching is we on our design team, we consider that oddness to be a feature of D&D &D and not a bug. That's part of what makes it delightful, that things will interact in unexpected ways and create these situations that can be funny, whimsical. They can also be scary. Sometimes these interactions will create situations where it's like, oh my goodness, what's going on? Uh, I, you know, where the characters might suddenly be questioning reality. Uh, you know, why are we perceiving things the way we're perceiving them? 
so I, I view these things as uh, little little seeds for creative on the spot narration by the dungeon master or by a creative player who's coming up with why is my magic working this way why is why am i interacting with my environment uh, in this particular fashion honestly i feel like those are the greatest gifts as a when i'm in the dm chair is when i get that question huh how does that how does that work out because it, it gives me an opportunity to be a little creative in the moment and spin a story with my friends and that's Honestly, that's that's the best feature of D and D, as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah, the unexpected, uh, that uh, that unexpected element in D and D that come from unexpected interactions, but then also the swinginess of the D twenty. Mm -hmm. That unexpectedness to me, again, I'm saying this now as a dungeon master and player, not as a game designer, <laughs> is one of the greatest gifts of the game. Uh, because it, even when you're the DM and have carefully planned out a session, I always love that moment as a DM where it's like, I did not see that coming. Mm -hmm. And and rather than that being like, oh my gosh, that's a, oh, what a gift. <laughs> it's, you know, just endless, delightful surprise. So good. All right. We have a very important question from Twitter. This comes from Phantom P0315. And they would like to know, why is there a cat race and yet no dog race exists? <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love this question. Uh, so, uh, first off, I, I, I might blow some people's minds with this answer, but there is already a race option in the game uh, that has canine features. Oh. Do you know what it is? Oh. I, I'm going to just blank because I'm on live stream. <laughs> the shifter. So the shifter in Eberron, uh, uh, because of the werewolf influence and whatnot, and because you as a player uh, largely can influence uh, the, your specific features and how they manifest, you can very easily have dog-like or wolf-like features. Now, I, I know what people are really getting at is the, the dog version of the tabaxi. Right. Uh, and, when, and we have heard that feedback. Uh, there is no sort of uh, feline favoritism going on here. Sometimes when we design things, there's a very organic process that occurs, and things will appear in our books based on the need of that book. And then it's only sometimes after the fact we'll realize, oh, we created this situation for the game as a whole that was unintended. And this, the cat versus dog thing is one of those things. Uh, it's really just sort of an organic development. But uh, everyone, uh, take heart. If you really want to today play a dog-like or uh, wolf-like person, I encourage you to check out the shifter uh, in Eberron Rising from the Last War. Perfect. Uh, the next question also comes from Twitter. This is co coming from Jojo. Uh, do this seems like a very timely question for Wild Beyond the Witchlight. Do hags in a coven share concentration, or does each one get their own? Uh, similarly, if one hag dies, do active spells stop? So uh, the rules on a hag coven, and you'll notice I'm not looking this up. I'm being naughty, not following my own <laughs> advice of looking it up. But it turns out. Hags and I are like this, so this one I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go with my <laughs> my deep connection <laughs> with hags. Uh, the coven rules do not actually change how concentration works, and so the individual hags continue to have their own concentration. And uh, no spell in the game ends if it's cast or dies unless the description of the spell specifically says so or if it's a spell that is running with concentration. Uh, so, you know, if the, if the soul caster of a spell and it's a concentration spell perishes, then yes, uh, the spell ends. Uh, but otherwise, spells with durations, like if you cast a spell that lasts for, it, you know, it says a duration, one hour, and then you croak, uh, your, <laughs> your spell keeps going for that hour uh, because some magic, and specifically magic that is not relying on concentration, once you basically let the magic loose in the world, 
it just goes until its duration runs out. With instantaneous magic, uh, actually there is no magic that lasts. There's a magic event that changes reality in some way, and then reality goes back to sort of its only quasi-magical state. And I say that because really the D&D multiverse is, even in an anti-magic field, there's still some like background magic because the entire uh, multiverse runs on it. Uh, whereas concentration spells, you can almost imagine a concentration spell as being this spell that feeds on the caster. Uh, the caster is providing magic fuel for the full duration of the spell. And the moment the caster uh, perishes, uh, is incapacitated, or takes enough damage that their concentration is broken, it's essentially the, fuels, the, the fuel supply got disrupted and the spell ends. Got it. That's a lot of great clarity on concentration in particular, which I know, especially if you're new to fifth edition, you might struggle with that concept. So I love I love getting filled in on that. Um, the next one is another one that we grabbed from from Discord. Uh, this one is about gates and bags of holding. So if I make a gate that leads to the inside of a bag of holding and then throw the bag of holding through the gate, what happens? Ah, uh, bag of holding questions. <laughs> these, 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 by the way, are a a f part of the fine, many decades long tradition of sage advice. Because mm -hmm. uh, for anyone who doesn't know, sage advice uh, as a name for the forum where que you know questions are asked about D and D's rules, sage advice goes all the way back to first edition, and. Uh, bag of holding questions are a are a tried and true <laughs> part <laughs> of the sage advice tradition. Now, uh, I am going to throw a monkey wrench in the whole scenario uh, that was <laughs> proposed. Uh, and often the bag of holding questions have some key piece that if you just pull it out, the whole thing falls apart, which I'm <laughs> going to do here. Uh, and And what it is, is that the gate spell says, you conjure a portal linking an unoccupied space you can see within range to a precise location on a different plane of existence. The inside of a bag of holding is not a plane of existence. It is at most an extra dimensional space, which is not the same thing. Ergo, you cannot open a gate into the inside of a bag of holding, at least not with the gate spell. Uh, there, there might be other magic that allows you to transport yourself into that uh, that purse-like state, but the <laughs> the gate spell ain't it. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and yes, I, I honestly don't think it would be a sage advice or <laughs> ask the sage without some kind of bag of holding related question. So <laughs> yeah. I had to get one in there. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the next one comes from Twitter, uh, Bob Ross, and then a whole bunch of numbers. I'm not going to read off. Sorry, but you know who you are. <laughs> Asks, are the golems blind sight derived from divination magic? If I were to cast non-detection and invisibility on someone, could a golem see them? So uh, none of any creature's senses are reliant on a particular type of magic unless the description of the creature says so. So... Uh, Unless a particular golem's write-up says this this vision is the result of divination magic, then that that sense is not affected by something that can then foil divination magic. So I'm sorry, that golem's going to be able to see you uh, in most circumstances okay. if you're within the if you're within the radius of its blind sight. Ah, makes sense. So we have a, a series of questions that are coming up next, and this also comes from Niv, uh, Mix It. I grabbed this series because they are questions I saw pop up in a lot of places because it turns out people have a lot of questions about Blade Singers. So the next few are all going to be focused on that topic. So get ready if you have questions about Blade Singers because your question's probably in here. Uh, the first part is asking about the Blade Singers cantrip. Uh, does the Blade Singers cantrip in the extra attack? proc eldritch knight's war magic feature ah right so this is a multi-class question so if anyone's mm -hmm. listening and are confused uh <laughs> why why does the why is there a question about a wizard subclasses uh <laughs> feature triggering 
a feature inside a fighter subclass. So this is a this is a question that presumes uh, multiclassing is in play, and that this character is a wizard blade singer multiclassing into a fighter eldritch knight. Mm -hmm. All right, now that I've laid that that groundwork for anyone who doesn't typically multiclass, mm -hmm. uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the cantrip in the blade singer's extra attack does fulfill the requirement in the Eldritch Knights feature, because the requirement there is simply, did you use your action to cast a cantrip? And the Blade Singer ability is, when you take the attack action, you have the option of, uh, once you get that extra attack feature, of replacing one of your attacks with a cantrip that you cast. So you are indeed casting a cantrip as part of your action. Uh, so that is a a really, if you're multiclassing, that is a tasty uh, <laughs> interaction that you can unlock if you decide to uh, combine Blade Singer with Eldritch Knight. It's definitely quite the investment. So it's good to know how that works. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because you do, you have to go pretty deep in both classes to unlock this combination. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next Blade Singer question is: Can they use their uh, the attack action to swing a sword and then cast Mending in six seconds? <laughs> no. Uh, and uh, again, uh, for anyone who's wondering, uh, what what is this question actually getting at? Mm -hmm. So the Mending spell uh, has a casting time of, I believe, one minute. I think that's I think why that's right. this question is being asked. Let me confirm. Yeah, one minute. Uh, and the uh, the extra attack action of the Blade Singer lets you replace one of your attacks to cast a cantrip. But that extra attack feature does not explicitly change the casting times of uh, any of your uh, cantrips. And so if you started casting this mending, well, you just started a minute. <laughs> yep. Your next nine rounds of combat are going to be riveting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As you, uh, I'm still casting. What are you doing over there? I'm still mending. <laughs> just you wait. <laughs> I'm going to mend this robe by, by the time this battle is over. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, this is another multi, uh, multi-class question related to, um, I suspect, probably a very similar build. But would a Blade Singer 6 Fighter 11 need to choose which extra attack feature to use, or would they get two attacks and a cantrip? Great question. So, uh, you and the multi-class rules touch on this obliquely. So the, the multi-class rules specify that if you get extra attack from two different sources, so in this case, you'd be getting it from the fighter and from the blade singer and the wizard. Multi-attack specifies that you don't add all the number of attacks together. Uh, now, this question, I say that rule addresses this obliquely because this question isn't about adding the attacks together necessarily but mm -hmm. it's could you know what about this extra exception inside the blade singer mm -hmm. what that multi-class rule is getting at is that you essentially have to pick one of your extra attack features to use that's the intent uh, and this is a great question because the rule doesn't hit this question head on mm -hmm. uh, certainly something we could clarify in a future version of that rule is really the intention is all up. If you have multiple extra attack features, you use only one of them, but you choose. You choose the one you want to use. Awesome. Uh, and I believe this is the last in the set of these questions for now. Uh, can a blade singer cast a cantrip and throw a net in the same attack action? <laughs> all right. This is getting at the nuances of the net. Yes. <laughs> If you were looking for crunchy uh, questions today, the by net. the way, guys, we've got them, so. <laughs> I love it. All right. Our friend, the net. All right, so for those of you who are not up on your net lore, 
the net specifies, and this is why this question is here, when you use an action, bonus action, or reaction to attack with a net, and this, so this would include the attack action, you can make only one attack regardless of the number of attacks you can normally make. Now rephrase, re-ask the question, please. So now so, that we have this established. Now that we have this established, can a blade singer cast a cantrip and throw a net in the same attack action? So the blade singer, so now we're going to go over, and it's a good thing I have Tasha's cauldron uh, on my desk, too. So handy. <laughs> <laughs> I came prepped. It's like, <laughs> what, what questions are you going to throw at me? I better have my books here so I can, I can easily find whatever it is. All right, here we go. Extra attack. You can cast one of your cantrips in place of one of your attacks. They use a part of the attack action. So the net says you can make only one attack, regardless of the number of attacks you can normally make. Mm -hmm. And the Blade Singer lets you replace one attack with the casting of a cantrip. So you can't do this. You can't do them both with the same action uh, because the net rule just said you get just one attack, and the blade singer rule is you can replace one attack with the casting of a cantrip. Meaning, so then if you replace that one attack, well then you're not throwing the net. If that makes sense, uh, it's they they essentially nullify each other. Uh, so. Short answer is <laughs> the Blade Singer cannot, using their extra attack feature, attack with a net and cast a cantrip uh, as a part of the same action. Got it. Let's move on to uh, another platform and another asker. This one came from Twitter. Cato uh, Catonian asks How do changes in spell presentation in the Wild Beyond the Witchlight stat blocks interact with other rules? Can these spells be cast at higher level, for example? So, in a, uh, by the way, in an upcoming uh, blog post, uh, should I should I talk about that actually as a little side thing? Sure, sure, let's do it. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, my uh, my sage advice column is going to be returning to the wizard's website, and actually very soon, uh, and it's going to be a part of our D and D Studio blog series. And we decided we wanted to revive Sage Advice as a as a written uh, communication uh, and also a way to dive deep into some of the tasty things coming up in our books. And uh, in that upcoming blog post, I talk about uh, how spellcasting appears in some of our more recent stat blocks. So. I did that that tease uh, that people have <laughs> uh, sage advice columns coming up to look forward to and also that addressed uh, this question. But I'll go ahead and answer the question now, too. So uh, anytime you have spell casting in a monster that does not use spell slots, then they cannot be upcast because upcasting, uh, which is just sort of our jargon for use a higher spell slot, uh, to cast the spell requires you to be using spell slots in the first place. Mm -hmm. We we have made a number of changes, not only in the Wild Beyond the Witchlight, but in a number of our upcoming books in how spell casting appears in most monsters, really with an eye toward improving the DM's play experience. Because one of the things that's become very clear over the last seven years is many of our spellcasting monsters are simply too complicated at the table. And so what, we're, what we are doing, and you're going to see this as an evolution over uh, a number of books over the next year, is us coming up with new ways to keep spellcasting monsters uh, and NPCs exciting, still spellcastery, but in a way that is much easier for the DM to manage. Mm. Uh, and one of the ways that we're doing that is we're making it so that spellcasting monsters don't actually rely on the DM picking the right spells in a wall of spell choices <laughs> to make that monster be as dangerous as it's supposed to be. Because one of the things that we're addressing in this new approach to spellcasting is in a lot of our spellcasting monsters, if the DM doesn't pick 
the most optimal damage spells that are in that spell list, most of our spellcasting monsters in play will end up with an effective challenge rating that's way lower than the challenge rating printed in the stat block. That's, mm -hmm. That challenge mm -hmm. rating printed in the stat block basically assumes the DM picked all the right spells. We don't want that to be the case anymore. So what you're going to see more and more is spellcasting creatures who have uh, unique actions that spell out a magical attack or saving throw ability spelled out in the stat block so that it is way easier for the DM to have that spellcaster basically punch at their CR level because we were finding too many spellcasters were punching way below their CR because it was too easy in actual play to miss that in this wall of text hiding down here was Cone of Cold and the CR assumed you cast Cone of Cold every round. Uh, and or, you know, there and there I could use many examples of this. Mm -hmm. So what that means, then, is what we put in the spellcasting action, which is, by the way, now an action instead of a trait. The spells that go there are almost always utility spells. We're now making sure that the spells that are there, it's obvious that they are not for combat. Uh, so that they're not sort of a trap for the DM. Mm -hmm. Or if they are for combat, we ensure that if the DM decides to cast one of them instead of the built-in actions elsewhere in the stat block, the monster CR is still going to roughly come out where it should be. In other words, we've made it so you don't have to worry about upcasting. Uh, and we also don't want you to have to worry about um, keeping track of slots uh, mm -hmm. in a monster because a DM is almost always managing multiple monsters at once. And this is going to be something as we continue to evolve our, our ever living game, mm -hmm. we're always looking for ways that we can make our DM's lives easier, keep the game exciting, and in many cases scarier because if you, one of the things you should take away from what I'm saying is we're simplifying how you play these spellcasters to make them scarier <laughs> because <laughs> we're, we're, we're making it so that it's going to be way easier for the DM to open up a, one of these stat blocks, make some quick choices, and have this creature bring the hurt that their CR says they're supposed to be bringing. Uh, and so... Because we also don't want the gotcha of, well, the spellcaster will only hit its CR if you not only pick the right spell, but have figured out that you should upcast it. Mm -hmm. As designers, we do not want DMs having to uh, worry about gotchas like that. Uh, a, a monster, more and more we want it so that you, you open it up and it is going to deliver what its CR promises. And, and so you're seeing this most obviously right now in our spellcaster design, mm -hmm. uh, but you're also going to start seeing it in our non-spellcaster monsters as well, uh, where monsters are just going to start feeling like, oof, they got scarier. Uh, and, and one of the reasons is we are now requiring a monster to hit its challenge rating in more ways than just sort of one golden path, because... Uh, and here, this is a look behind the curtain. In a lot of our CR calculations thus far in 5th edition, we typically only require a monster to sort of hit its CR through sort of one path of behavior. The downside of that is, that, and by the way, that's because CR really is only a measure of how likely is this monster to TPK a party. That's really all <laughs> it's for. Uh, but... What we found is by taking the approach that we did of calculating based on the DM making all optimal choices is, again, it's way too easy for a creature to unexpectedly for the DM uh, sort of, again, punch below its CR. Mm -hmm. And we were correcting that uh, because we, again, don't want... I talked earlier about delightful surprise, which <laughs> D&D is filled with. We prefer the delightful surprise to arise from die rolls or fascinating rules interactions, not the kind of surprise that comes from, I chose a CR11 creature, 
And it sure is surprising. It felt like CR3. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's not the kind of surprise we want. Uh, we want it to be like, no, the CR11 feels like CR11. Unless, and again, DMs, you still have liberty. If you decide to have the spellcasting monster cast Mending for three rounds, that is on you, my friends. <laughs> 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 and you still have that liberty. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, the next one that we have um, comes from Discord. Primordial Trees asked uh, a tips and tricks question. What tricks do you have for remembering concentration checks on taking damage? It seems to be an often forgotten uh, uh, rule to remember at my table. So when it comes to spell management, I as a DM... And many of you who've watched me, DM Acquisitions Incorporated, have actually witnessed this. I treat each spellcasting player, and really the player of any type of character, whether they're a spellcaster or not, I treat each player as basically the DM of their character. And what mm -hmm. I mean by that is it's actually on the player when I'm the DM to manage their business. And that includes if they're concentrating on something and they take damage, checking. I once in a while as a GM will remember, oh wait, they were concentrating on something. They need to, to make a roll. If I realize that after the fact uh, and the player didn't bring it up, I will almost never uh, uh, interject and say, oh, you need to make a retroactive concentration check. Sometimes I will. Maybe I'm in a mood uh, and, 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 I, and I'm, going to, I'm going to enforce that. But if everyone at the table forgot, and we realize a few rounds later, I will almost never do it retroactively. Uh, and here's how I justify it. It's a, it's a random die roll. Mm. We're just going to assume they succeeded each time, <laughs> and we're going to move on with our lives. Uh, mm. And that, to me, is sort of the grace we can give ourselves as dungeon masters, remembering this is a game run by humans, mm. and we're not always going to remember everything. Uh, even if we stripped this game down to like the simplest game on earth, and I've witnessed this playing because I play a lot of other tabletop games, super simple card games, simple board games, people occasionally just forget things. Mm -hmm. And the grace we can usually give ourselves is just like, let's just keep moving and, and have a good time. And again, even that forgetting can be an opportunity to come up with some fun narrative rationale for why, why it worked out this way uh, in the world. Uh, you know, maybe the spellcaster is unusually resilient that day, uh, or they they meditated particularly well uh, during you know the tail end of their long rest, and they they're mentally prepared for <laughs> all of these challenges that are going to be ahead of them uh, in in the coming day. So. Getting back to the question, my mm -hmm. tip is DMs, remind your players at the beginning of each session until they really internalize it, they are responsible for uh, keeping track of their spells durations, whether they're concentrating. Uh, this also includes if you cast a spell that maybe does something uh, uh, to foes at the start of, your fo of those foes turns, it's the player's responsibility to remind me as the DM that, you know, that that goes on. One thing you can do, by the way, if you have a group that's notorious for forgetting these things, like I'm concentrating on a spell and taking damage, is you could uh, use a miniature or a token mm -hmm. or a card that you lay in front of anyone who's concentrating. And that can be a visual reminder for everyone at the table Concentration is in play, and we want to remember it. Uh, because it, concentration, to me, one of the fabulous things about it is it can create narrative tension. Oh mm -hmm. my gosh, are they going to be able to keep that spell going? And remember, that applies to monster spellcasters, too, because if they're yeah. concentrating so on something, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, are we going to be able to uh, break their concentration and get this horrible <laughs> spell to stop? Uh, so try, if you have trouble remembering, put, putting some kind of token or card in front of the, the player uh, or in front of the DM if uh, a, a character they're controlling is currently concentrating on something. Excellent tip. I think we're almost out of time, but I really wanted to squeeze this last one in because I also saw Twitch chat asking a lot about it. So this one's pretty key. Uh, Stormbreaker on Twitter asks, does the Herringon's rabbit hop cost movement? like a long high jump does? Uh, 
And people, by the way, also as another teaser for my upcoming Sage Advice column, <laughs> I answer a number of hair and gone questions uh, in that. But as a preview, I'll answer this question. So uh, the rabbit hop does not expend movement. And you can see our, our design intent here if you compare the wording of rabbit hop to the wording of the high jump and the long jump. The high jump and the long jump in the player's handbook both explicitly state they consume movement whereas rabbit hop does not, which is also why we specify in rabbit hop, you can't do it if your speed is zero. That's why we <laughs> had to put that in, because mm -hmm. otherwise the Herringon otherwise the who's uh, petrified could somehow be hopping. <laughs> um, because the, the, the purpose of rabbit hop is for this to be extra. It is a fabulous trait which is also why it's limited. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I've seen some people noting, wow, this is amazing, which was also feedback we got after the Unearthed Arcana. Well, that's why Herringons uh, can use it only a certain number of times per day, uh, <laughs> because it is a potent trait. Uh, and I think uh, one's uh, one that uh, uh, Herringon players are going to love using. Absolutely. I can't wait to start. I'm, I've rolling up a hair and gone is one of the things that's next up on my list so that'll be a ton of fun to play around with uh that is unfortunately the last question that we have time for today man this blew by this was wonderful thank you so much for joining us today those of you in chat thank you for joining us today jeremy I, we all appreciate your time we know you're busy <laughs> well i love i love being here thank you brandy for hosting this and thank you everyone who sent in questions Absolutely. Awesome. So thanks again for making the time to join us at D&D &D Celebration. Up next, we have the incredible B. Dave Walters and his monster squad of misfits coming together to help a dragon reclaim her hoard in the dungeon and the dragon. So stay tuned for that. That is going to be an absolute unit of a game. So enjoy the rest of the show and we will see you next time. Bye.